All right, everyone, I hope that you are ready for a good demonstration. This is one of my favorites, and I think you will figure out why it's one of my favorites once you see it react. Now, of course, like everything in nature, you know, we have to give it nature's conditions to the, you know, right degree so that it will do what we expect. Well, what do we expect? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take zinc and I'm going to mix it with iodine. Now, it says crystals. Does that really mean anything? No, not for our reaction. Okay, so what we're going to do, I'm going to put zinc and, you know, the symbol. Um, and I'm going to put a plus sign. And then iodine. And... I'm going to put an arrow to show that these are reacting. And what are they forming? Well, right now, let's just mix them. So Zn, I. Okay, two things we need to check. One is diatomics. Diatomics are on this at the top. So if you'll see, zinc is not on my list of the seven diatomic elements. I do see iodine. That means that when iodine is by itself, over here, it's not by itself, it's in a compound. So we do not do diatomics when it's in a compound, only when it's by itself. Diatomic means that it has two atoms, diatomic. Zinc's not on the list, I don't worry about it. And remember, the charges are zero on both of these. Charges are not zero here because they've changed electrons. Iodine gained them and zinc uh, gave them up. Well, let's see how many. Zinc is in um, the transition metals but we can see that it's in group two. It is not one of the highlighted ones that we put on our periodic table. It has a charge of plus two. Iodine is in group seven. Seven minus eight gives me negative one. So that means I have not got the same charges, so I need a crisscross. No pluses, no minuses, just the two and just the one. Now. I don't need to write the one because once I write zinc, it's already one. Okay, so let's get rid of these little charges. Get them out of the way. We've already used them. Now, is it balanced? One zinc to start with, I end up with one. I've got two iodines here and I've got two iodines there. So I'm good. This is balanced already. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're going to take some zinc and zinc comes in several forms. This is one. And as you can see, they're just like little lumpies. And they call this mossy zinc. I'm not sure why there's no moss on it, but that's what it's called, mossy zinc. And that's the form that you would expect to have. Okay, what we're going to use is aluminum, aluminum zinc, but we're going to use it in the powder form. Now, this reaction, I don't need to measure. What I can do is just get an approximation, as long as I get approximately the same amount. Some reactions you really have to measure, this one you don't. Okay, so you can see that the metal has been ground up. I cannot do this with an ordinary mortar and pestle because the, the zinc is just too hard, but I buy it in the powder form. What that does is it gives it a larger surface area. So in order to react faster, I want a large surface area. If I were you to use the mossy zinc, eh, you'd probably go like, meh, that's not a great reaction. So I wanna give it as dr uh, dramatic effect as possible. Okay, so now let's see my, my iodine. <laughs> Uh, that's not too old of a bottle, but what it does is it, it goes from the solid form into a gas very easily, and then it reacts with a lot of things around it. Uh, you can tell it's already started reacting with my paper towel, just, just um, the iodine itself. Okay, iodine crystals are kind of a bluish black, and so that is what iodine looks like coming out of the, the container. What I need to do is grind it up. And so I'm going to take my mortar and pestle and I'm going to crunch it and really try to grind it up. 
And let's see, go ahead and pour this in. And let's really crush it and make it really fine. The more I grind it up, the higher the surface area and the better reaction I'll get. Because the, the molecules, the particles can come closer together. All right, now, iodine in its crystal form, eh, it's pretty and it's shiny. It's kind of a blackish, bluish purple. Well, let's see if we can get it to turn into a gas. So what I can do with this is go from a solid to a gas. What do you call that? I know you know. Let me hear it. Say it louder. Yes, yeah, sublimation. So let's see if we can get this to sublimate. Okay, it does not need a lot of energy to sublimate, so I'm gonna put it over a candle. And let's take and see if we can just warm it up gently. And what we're doing is applying energy to go from atoms being in the crystal state where they're close together, they're closely packed, neatly arranged. And let's see if we can get them to separate. Let's get them into the gaseous phase. And so now they're being separated. So now the little I2 crystals, because you still have them diatomic, and now they're starting to go into the gas phase. So now we can see the color a lot better. So notice sublimation, you do not have any liquid being formed. And you can start seeing that beautiful purple color. Okay, here I wanted to show you the little crystals that have appeared on the side. I've let it cool down, and as I turn it around, you can see the crystals on the sides of the test tube. And what that's done, it's recrystallized. So it went from a crystal to a vapor and then back to a crystal. And this is one of the uh, ways that you can purify things is to let it recrystallize because the recrystallization, it usually gets rid of a lot of impurities. All right, we now have our reactants or reagents, if you want to call them. We've got them ready. We've ground up the iodine. And so now we're going to mix them together. And for this reaction, since I don't want to put the glass down from the fume hood, I want you to see it. I'm going to actually put on face, a face shield. Um, so I've got, the uh, I've got the zinc powder. I've got the iodine powder. Let's mix those together. And you all remember what this is called, right? Mortar pestle. All right, so now we're going to mix them together. just so that they're coming in contact with one another. Now, are you seeing in a reaction? You probably won't. Um, the only time that you might see a reaction is when it's a very humid day. You know, humid, humidity gives it water, and actually this actually needs water to react. It's kind of like a catalyst, and so it's not gonna usually do anything until, it, until we put some water on it. All right, now. I'm going to make a little dome in the middle, and then I'm going to make just a little well, kind of like a, you know, just a little well. Okay, so now let's add some water to it, and then I'm going to step back. And let's see it react.
right, final product, not that impressive, but you have in there zinc and iodine, which make zinc iodide. Now, uh, I could get the zinc iodide out by dissolving, putting more water into it, and then recrystallizing the, uh, the uh, zinc iodide. Okay, now while I clean up, I've noticed that my jar that I've gotten this out of, the got this film on it that it's pretty well gone. So what I'm gonna do is take that off, let's throw it away, and let's get a new piece. This stuff right here is called, para, well, they call it parafilm, that is the kind of the brand name. Uh, but laboratory film is a really cool thing. So what you wanna do is unpeel some of it, Let's take some scissors, Let's get a nice square. So we cut it and it has paper on it just so it won't stick together. So take the paper and throw that away. This stuff, it's really fascinating. It's stretchy and so what you can do is stretch this. Don't stretch it too much, it will break. And now take this and you're going to seal up your container. So I'm going to put this around it, and if I just leave it like that, well, won't be too good. So let's take, and I'm going to twist this and twist it over here, and this, I'll twist it, and then it will make a nice seal on here. And now I can store this, and it'll be a lot safer um, you know, for our chemistry stock room. Okay, we're going to take a look at our third and final synthesis reaction. I'm going to mix sulfur with iron, and I've got sulfur plus iron. Notice the charges are zero. They're reacting, and it's forming iron sulfide. Now, can you tell me the name? It's not just iron sulfide. It's iron, and there's a Roman numeral, because iron can either have a plus two or plus three. So we're going to name this iron Roman numeral two. <laughs> sulfide. Notice I changed the ending on the sulfur to reflect that it is uh, now a compound. Okay, neither of these are diatomic. Um, I've got this written correctly, 2 plus and 2 minus, and um, I know that this is the correct formula because um, um, I'm familiar with the reaction. Okay, so then that means that this is already balanced. Now, in this reaction, it needs to have some energy in order to react. I can mix these two and mix them and mix them and mix them, and nothing's going to happen until I heat it up. So, what that means is it's an exothermic reaction. I'm going to give it some activation energy, and then it's going to continue. So, it doesn't mean that it's an endothermic reaction because I don't have to continuously give it heat. If I continuously have to give it heat, as long as it's reacting, that's an endothermic reaction. But an exothermic reaction is when you start it, once it starts, it continues on its own, and then you don't have to keep supplying that energy. Okay, so what that means is if you plot a graph of energy versus time, you have your energy of your reactants, because I'm gonna start out with reactants, and then what I'm gonna do right here is I'm gonna give it some energy. And in this case, I'm gonna take a heat, a stirring rod and heat it up. Okay, and then I'm gonna supply that energy as, as soon as I reach the maximum of what this energy is, then the reaction proceeds on its own is gonna produce a lot of energy, which you will see in the reaction. And so the energy of the products is lower because the energy of the reactants it lost energy, you know, heat, light, you know, um, and so it lost it, and now the energy of products is lower. We call this right here the delta H, which is change in heat of the reaction. Uh, Pre-AP, you should know um, also the term enthalpy. Which is a fancy way of saying heat. All right, let's take a look at our reaction. Okay, for this reaction, what I have done 
is I've gone ahead and measured these out. This is one that needs a stoichiometric ratio. So that means that I have to run the reaction, I have to do the calculations, and find out how much of each do I need to start with to give it the right ratio for the product. So I have a certain amount of grams of each of these. I've measured out four grams and seven grams of, of um, iron filings. Now iron filings, as you can see, is kind of a you know, almost crystalline um, form to it. Okay, this right here is the sulfur. And as you can see, it's just a powder. Okay, now I'm gonna mix these two together. And I need something, because it generates a lot of heat, it's a very exothermic reaction. I need something uh, that it's not gonna break. If I did this on a watch glass, for example, this, if I did this on a watch glass, it would shatter it. Um, if I did it in the um, um, evaporating dish that I used on the last reaction, it would break it. So what I've got is a metal base plate. And let's take, and I need to mix these together. Now remember we ground the iodine on the last reaction? Well some things are safe to grind and others are not. This is something you don't want to give the activation energy to too quickly because it's pretty low. Um, what um, If I start to mix these in a, in a mortar, I might go ahead and set the reaction off and I don't want to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these and just mix them back and forth until they're fairly mixed. Okay, so now what we have is a mixture. We have a physical blend of, of two elements, but they're not a compound. Let's make them into a compound. Okay, as you can see, they're sitting there and nothing is happening. Well, let's see if we can get them to react. <laughs> So what I'm going to use is a stirring rod, and since I want to know, I want to make sure I know the cold end from the hot end, sometimes you can add a little bit of a tape, and that way you know which is hot and cold, because you cannot tell if glass is hot or not. Now I'm going to protect my fingers, I'm going to use a silicone pad, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in the Bunsen burner flame, and I'm going to get the end of that pretty hot. And this is one way I can supply activation energy. So what I'm going to do is put that down into the mixture and let's see if we can give it enough so it'll start reacting.
And there you have it, the making of iron 2 sulfide. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time.